Wonderful. Well, thank you all very, very much for joining us. Um, I don't know if someone has already asked you please to turn off your cell phones, but if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Um, you will have in the handout um, bios, uh, of course, uh, Chairman Greenspan needs no introduction, and we have so many interesting things to cover today that I'm going to jump um, right away into the conversation. Um, because there is so much to talk about, um, we will try to cover a range of topics, which will mean that we won't get to hear all you have to say on a given topic. But I will ask questions for the first half hour or so and then turn it over to the audience. So if you have questions, uh, we'll bring the mic over and, and have you to them. Um, but let me start with um, the US and the current situation. We've had some mixed news lately. We had pretty flat GDP growth in the last quarter. On the other hand, we had an unusually strong jobs report uh, for the last month. Uh, where are we in your view? Do we see the economy finally recovering and on the other side of this recession, or is this another false start? Uh, that's the toughest question. Why don't we, why don't we leave that to last? <laughs> uh, first of all, let me just say that the first quarter is going to be revised down to probably minus 0.7 or 0.8. Uh, the numbers are extraordinarily weak, but Fortunately, there are data that come, if you look at the monthly pattern, it's improving through the quarter, and April looked, looked fairly good as far as we can judge it. We don't know exactly how, it, how it's going to play out. But the important issue is that we are seeing certain signs which we haven't seen before. There's one little statistic, uh, there's several statistics that I use. Uh, we watch uh, uh, railroad freight car loadings and weight them by industrial production, and they have moved up uh, fairly decidedly in the last several weeks. Uh, most importantly, for the first time, we've actually seen commercial and industrial loans break out of a very narrow band. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is important is with a very large amount of reserve balances held by the depository institutions. Uh, it's going to require a very specific breakout before all of those monies which are sitting net idle, and they've been sitting in net idle for months and a couple of years, really. Uh, there's no evidence that QE1, 2, or 3 is actually filtered into the economy with the exception causing asset prices to go up. But if you look at the flow of where funds are moving, they're just stuck dead in those deposits, earning 25 basis points. They're starting to move, and the way you can see that is that part of those reserves are being drawn on to make commercial and industrial loans, which is the most sensitive part of the financial system. All of that is good. Uh, I'll answer the, the last part of the question at the very end when uh, I'll, have more, I'll have more information. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, but the, the real interesting question here is, how have we been going through for the last five years? <clears throat> the last five years, a particular type of economy uh, which essentially uh, makes these false starts inevitable because we're running up against ceilings. I think the answer to that question is yes. And I think that it's essentially a very deep-seated problem best described by the fact that there is an extraordinary pall of lack of confidence in the system. But rather than just think in terms of psychology, uh, what I do is I take a look at where are the weak points in the economy. One of the things I think which is very useful to do is to take the gross domestic product and instead of breaking it down into consumption expenditures and uh, government spending and business spending, take the whole GDP and segregate each item and calculate its life expectancy. Software is three to five years industrial buildings, 35 years, 
uh, haircuts, one month. But you get a very interesting statistic because what that shows is that all of the shortfall that now exists in the economy is a result of a decline of assets with life expectancies of greater than 20 years, mainly structures, but not wholly that. But just as importantly, what you find is that, that it is not a fixed point of 20 years things stop. You can start with software, which is the shortest of the capital investments. That's doing rather well. And short-term equipment is doing well. But uh, 18, 19 year uh, life expectancy industrial equipment is not. And long-term capital structures are doing extremely poorly and have barely recovered. Now, if, if, you, if you home in on this long-term investment question, is this a structural aspect of our economy now, that value is being created with less assets, or is this something around the investment psychology that's preventing people from making rational investments that would be longer term? Well, I think the best thing to do is to ask where do those numbers come from? And one of the things I find very useful, first of all, the structures, of course, is twofold. It's um, non-residential, and residential. They both have fundamentally the same cause, but they're obviously very different economic phenomena. But what I do for the business part is I take a look at two things. One is the, the share of liquid cash flow, which corporations choose to invest in illiquid long-term assets. That's a very extraordinarily useful measure of the long-term <laughs> confidence of business because it doesn't ask you what they think, it looks at what they do. Not what they say, who cares? But what they're doing is exactly what you'd think they would be doing in a period such as this. That ratio, which during periods of boom has gone up uh, very significantly, the ratio has basically gone up to uh, capital investment being 50% uh, higher than cash flow. That's rare, but it gets there. The data that happened, the, the figures from, from 2009 was the lowest ratio of investment to cash flow since 1938. I should say peacetime. But more important, just as importantly, there is an, another indication of uh, the, the, the actual pattern is not linear. It actually accelerates the farther out that you go into the distant future. And the way, way you can tell that is that the spread between five-year U.S. Treasury notes and 30-year bonds is at an extremely elevated slope, meaning that the rate of discount is going up very rapidly. But that ratio now, or that, that, that slope, is the largest in American history. Now, are these investors scared unnecessarily, or are they being wise? Because, in fact, you know, if you can create $18 billion of market cap, as WhatsApp did, with very little capital investment, very few employees, better off focusing your money on those short-term investments than trying to build the capital uh, that will require malls and roads and, and whatnot. Well, actually, um, uh, before I went to the Fed, I spent a good deal of time in corporate boardrooms discussing capital projects. And I can tell you how they do it. And why, or what, what you see in those boardrooms is very informative. You find that uh, there's a specific project which the chairman of the board or the chief executives are terribly desirous of getting the director's authorization. And so they get a product manager, and he comes up, and he gives all these wonderful things about this new, new investment. And it's going to have an after-tax rate of return of 20% over a protracted period, and well, the bells and whistles. Then somebody asks, what is the variance of that forecast? And if he says, as he would have to, 
Well, we, there is a not insignificant probability that the investment can be minus 10%, gone. Uh, and uh, it is uh, fascinating to watch how the response to a very widespread is very negative. So it's not so much what people think, it's what their ability is to see into the future. I mean, for example, one of the reasons that it's very difficult to get authorization for long-term assets, not only in the United States, but every place else, is that you've got, uh, specifically in the United States, a, an impossible notion of where tax rates are going to be 20 years from now. There's almost no way. Uh, 20 years ago, we could, because it was a pretty, uh, pretty uh, standard view of what they might be. But now we're dealing with all sorts of things, including uh, climate problems, environmental problems, uh, uh, and now, of course, uh, the resurrection of the Cold War to a greater or lesser extent. These are not irrational reactions. These are basically fundamental causes of uncertainty. And so I look at the business sector basically in the context of what is the average long-term expected rate of return. And the, then what the variance is to the extent that you can, you can use it. And there is, we, we've recovered some, some from the lows. And I think that's the reason why we're getting some of this sort of uh, rise in commercial industrial loans and the things are moving. But the problem is if this all begins to cause long-term interest rates to start to move, that is going to stop dead in the water. And what will cause the interest rates to move, basically, is what is the effective capacity of the economy. And uh, if, as a number of people suspect, that uh, we've got uh, uh, major problems in our labor market, where a very significant part of the potential workforce is not working, but more importantly, we're retiring part of the best part of our labor force. And it's showing up, and uh, uh, you can see it. The, the data are very disturbing. Uh, on the issue of uh, physical capacity capability, uh, we have, we have a considerable amount of slack, but it's distorted. And we've got uh, the real problems, as I said before, are basically in the long-term assets, mainly construction. And as you could expect, uh, there are huge problems in part of, part of the economy, which is very largely in that area. If, for example, you take a look at the proportion of structures that is residential and non-residential to GDP, those numbers are from, from the peak in 2006 down to 2011, that went down five percentage points of GDP. Now, uh, not all of that is uh, short term, but uh, we are going to get reasonably long-term losses right now, and it's going to be very difficult to get the economy through enough capacity to get it really moving. So some real caution on the US, but since we do want to touch a couple of regions, let me uh, move um, to another area where there's a lot of question as to what the future holds, uh, but very critical to the global economy, which is China. Is China stalling finally after decades of extraordinary growth, or can it restore this very high growth model for another decade? What will happen and how will its contribution to the global economy evolve? It is now technically the largest economy on a PPP basis, and does that mean anything? I mean, that's because of its purchasing power parity. That, uh, that's a wonderful statistic, but they're not there yet. Uh, China is a very interesting case, which I think uh, uh, 
to start off 20 years ago, the per capita GDP in China, or I should say the United States, was 40 times what it was there. Uh, now it's five times, and it's closing. Uh, the problem that disturbs me is that as you close the gap, uh, oh, what, we, what, we, what we see is very substantial productivity increases. That's, that's the only way to get the type of growth you're seeing. But it is turning out that virtually none of it is indigenous. All of it is basically borrowed or whatever you, or the words you want to use. Uh, but the, there is a very interesting study by the Thompson uh, Reuters and they, it's been doing for the last several years. They have been asking, they've been trying to figure out who are the 100 most innovative corporations in the world. Uh, the latest report, 45 were American, zero were Chinese. Mm -hmm. And this is, raises a very interesting question as to whether uh, that's an accident. But in an authoritarian state, uh, the issue of innovation is very difficult, or I should say, just basic uh, indigenous innovation, because by definition, innovation is something nobody thought about before. If they thought about it, it's not innovation. Mm -hmm. The problem that you have, however, is that if you have restraint occurring in the society about uh, wh where you, what, you, what you can think about, what you can talk about, and even though China is changing, I think, in a very positive direction, it's doing so very slowly. And so that the issue of going outside the conventional wisdom, which is what basically happens, uh, that is very difficult to do in an authoritarian state. They cannot do it in Russia. They cannot do it in China. They surely cannot do it in North Korea. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a problem. You mentioned Russia, which of course dominates the headlines today with um, the Ukraine situation and otherwise. What's your sense of how big an issue for the global economy is the current Russia situation, uh, both their role in the energy world, the sanctions that the US, the EU may put on them either now or in the future? Is this a, a, a big additional source of uncertainty from your point of view or, or, not, or marginal? Well, I was involved in setting up uh, the sanctions uh, against Iran uh, early on. And uh, I was fascinated in the extent to which they, the, the issue of the, the power of the American banking system and their correspondent banking, that uh, uh, we were able to actually get some really significant impacts which really uh, were beginning to work. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's very different in the Ukraine uh, because uh, there's really nothing you can touch. And when you can touch it, it hurts us more. By more, I mean, it'll be like NATO. It hurts NATO more than it hurts us, or rather, it hurts them. And the, the, the the, the, the reason for that is that uh, I've th always thought that uh, uh, Europe made a mistake in not trying to wean itself off Russian natural gas. Uh, I think, I've forgotten what the number is, but I think something like a third, uh, a third of uh, the Eurozone's gas is probably coming uh, from, uh, directly from Russia. Uh, and um, it may be more than that, I'm not sure. But natural gas is not like crude oil. Crude oil, you can move around physically, and it's very easy. And uh, if, for example, the Russians were to cut off their shipments of crude oil to the rest of the world, uh, we could rev up, uh, there's a 
there was maybe two, three million barrels a day excess in Saudi Arabia, which could be picked up. And Lord knows what's happening in North Dakota. I mean, we're just doing an awful lot mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But natural gas is very tricky. Uh, the only way we can get gas to Europe is by liquefaction. Mm -hmm. And we, up until three or four years ago, we were going to be the major recipient of liquefied natural gas. And we had built up all of these facilities. And then all of a sudden, this Mitchell Corporation in Texas uh, devised fracking, fracking. And it changed the world wholly around. And uh, what, we, what we're seeing now is that we don't have facilities, as far as I remember, that are, uh, go, will go online to ship the stuff from, for example, uh, the North Dakota fields out at, into the European pipelines. That's at least a year away, and certainly even much more than that in volume. And the reason is, is that a liquefaction is a very expensive operation, and the boats that you have to employ to get it there is another factor which is very critical. So it'll be a long time before uh, we can create uh, from our fields uh, a significant solution to uh, the European. Because another aspect of uh, liquefied natural gas, which is very relevant to this, is that because it is such a difficult process, most of the new facilities are committed in advance. In other words, you don't build a plant to export liquefied natural gas unless you can guarantee the markets, which means you have to sign contracts. And so this, this is not going to happen easily here. But the Russians have, in the past, shut down the, the flow of gas uh, through Ukraine. Uh, so another big there. source of uncertainty is what I'm hearing on many dimensions. Well, this is and, a big and one. your sense that it will have a significant impact, at least in the short term, because not too much can be addressed. Well, yeah, the, well we're fortunate in a certain sense. The, uh, the winter was rather mild in Europe. And that meant that they built up uh, inventories of regular gas. And so it's not going to hit Europe until you get into the fall and early winter. But if the Russians decide at that point to turn the knob, I don't know what we do about it. They were, they were turning the knob before we had uh, the really obvious, at least in my judgment, Putin deciding that the it was a mistake to break up the Soviet Union. Let's put it back all together. Let's put it back together again. And he's working at that. And uh, he, has, he has very considerable. Evidence. So he could have a huge impact on Europe. Uh, but of course, even before Russia and Putin's uh, Ukrainian adventure, um, Europe has been a source of pretty significant instability. And we seem to have subsided from the panic days of uh, 18. 24 months ago. Is it over? If, we, if they can buy step the Russia thing, is um, Europe going to be OK? Or what, what is your sense about how robust uh, the Well, there's another statistic that I collect every week, which is the size of the ECB uh, balance sheet. And you could see the crisis emerging as all of a sudden it started up as all of that to, and essentially, what the ECB was doing was taking the, uh, uh, taking the sovereign credit uh, embodied in the euro and lending it out, first with very strict uh, conditions under Maastricht, which didn't help the situation. Uh, and then finally, with this other monetary transaction thing, which they basically uh, uh, considered, and uh, uh, it worked. But it worked. Uh, uh, there, there, there's there's no, no drawing on that facility. But Europe got to the point where if it didn't work, meaning if 
you didn't stop the, 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 the run in, say, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy. Uh, there was no other place to go. See, in the United States, if our banking system fails, our sovereign credit of the federal government can bail it out. But in Europe, what they have only is the euro and the individual members, which don't always agree with each other, in fact, rarely do. Uh, and you have basically two, two, two euro areas. It's the periphery and it's, the, the, it's north and south. And uh, I, I sat in in the uh, very early stages, uh, oh, 1994, 95, 96. You were an early skeptic of this experiment. Well, I, I used to show up in Basel, Switzerland, where the Bank for International Settlements uh, uh, would host the G10 governors. And it was just fascinating because the G10, which of course is, was 11 countries, uh, had uh, uh, regular Sunday dinners, which just no staff, nothing. And uh, because, with the exception of uh, Canada, Japan, the United States, the Royal European, uh, I, would, I, had, I was sitting there at the birth of the Euro. It was fascinating to watch before they had a name for it. And they were all acutely aware that there were cultural differences which were significant. And they basically were trying to replicate the type of monetary system which the United States had, which was with the 50 individual states with a single currency. Mm -hmm. And there was a recognition that, uh, uh, that you couldn't largely say that uh, uh, cultural differences and differences in language and the like were not a problem, but there was a, a remarkable <coughs> conviction on the part of the European Central Bankers that it could be made to work. Uh, and mainly because most of them looked for, you know, it seemed two major wars on the European continent in less than 30 years. Uh, and they were always looking into the future as to what could we do to prevent that. And uh, so it wasn't so much getting the euro, but it was another step towards political integration. Mm -hmm. Of the, the EC, of yes, yeah, and um, so the, you know that you can see that's where they were going. Anyway, the general notion was, to be sure, the Italians and the Spaniards are different from the Germans and the Austrians, but when we get them all into a single currency, the Italians would behave like Germans. Well, that may have seemed a crazy view, but the markets believed it. Mm -hmm. Because what you see, for example, with the Italians is that my recollection was that the spread of uh, lira denominated bonds was 500 basis points over the German Bund. And as we approached January 1st, 1999, the beginning of the official Euro thing, uh, we uh, collapsed that spread down to about 20 basis points. And uh, so everyone said, well, the financial markets believe it. Maybe it is true. And indeed, for a decade, the system worked extraordinarily. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it, but I, there it was in front of my eyes. They made it work. Uh, the, the problem is, in retrospect, we realized that there was such a global boom going on that there was no such thing as non-competitive nations because everyone could sell everything they could make. But with the 2008 crisis, the whole thing opened up, the spreads opened up dramatically, and uh, back to where they were prior to the onset of the euro. I remember, uh, prior to the onset of the euro, it was not that. Uh, the, 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 the Greece and Portugal and Spain and Italy uh, 
somehow managed, they all had serial devaluations. Mm -hmm. And their, un their unit costs continued to rise relative to the northern, northern European groups. And the result of that uh, was that when they came together, there was only one currency you couldn't devalue anymore. But for 10 years, they didn't need to. But when you ran into the break in 2008, the whole thing unwound. And uh, the ECB was very limited in what it could mm -hmm, do mm -hmm. to help because it, it was constructed by the Ma Maastricht Treaty, Maastricht Treaty, which had, was Germanic in virtually every respect. And indeed, the euro was supposed to be replicating the Deutsche Mark. But, uh, from day one, the data show that none of the southern European countries uh, basically behaved like the northerns. And uh, in fact, the book I finished uh, last year, I go through this in some detail. It's very interesting to see it, uh, how, it, how it evolves. But where we are now is that Mario Draghi basically took the European Central Bank out of Maastricht and said, whatever is required to save the euro, we will do. Will do. And the reason why that was working is uh, Angela Merkel uh, was very concerned about the euro breaking up, because that would mean that the subsidy that the Germans were getting with a weak euro relative to the shadow Deutsche Mark would be eliminated. They, the Germans had a big export competitive advantage, so that they had reasons to wanting to keep it together. Clearly, the Greeks wanted to keep it together, and everyone wanted to keep it together. And uh, so when Draghi basically said, uh, we'll do whatever has to be done, uh, the markets believed it. They didn't have a single loan of the so-called uh, other monetary transactions, which was the name they put on a particular facility. And uh, the whole thing turned around, but never fully, because there was a thing called Target 2 in the European central banking system, which is the intra-central bank uh, uh, net lending to each other. And uh, all of the 17 uh, countries are members of that. And when you look at who is lending to whom, it's sort of obvious. But net, the Germans, major in the Netherlands and Finland and the like, were net creditors. Uh, basically, Spain and Italy were the two big debtors. That is still existing. In other words, mm -hmm. the, amount, the amount of uh, uh, net lending has come down between the North and the South, but it's still there. And uh, it is not evident to me that the cultural differences are all been resolved. So you, another a source of uncertainty. A very long answer to a very short a, a question. Very, uh, another source of uncertainty. We've left a few places of the world off the table, Latin America, Africa, others. We can come back to the questions. But I know you're all eager to ask some questions. If you don't, I have plenty more to go. But let me now turn it over to the audience. I ask you, please, uh, to raise your hand. A spe um, one of these will, a microphone will come to you. And please hold the microphone close to your mouth so we can hear you properly. Yes, why don't we start with you? I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. My recollection is that when you had to testify before Congress, you were really mystified by the 08 collapse. And I guess my question is about the metrics you use to evaluate. It sounds to me as if you're using the metrics that are now coming out in Picardy's new book. Maybe you understood all this before. But I guess my question is, what do you think are the metrics the rest of us ought to understand in terms of evaluating 
Are you talking, uh, well, it's... The, Capitalism and the... Yeah, no, but this is a different, there's a whole series of questions implicit in it. Uh, let me just tell you, there are two issues. I'll, let me do it one at a time. Uh, I always presumed that individuals acted mainly rationally, but significant part of it was irrational in the way they designed it. But since it's very evident that progress is only made through rational insight, syllogisms, that everything else sort of washed out. In other words, it, uh, the telegraph was not invented by somebody who had an intuition. You had to go think it through. So that I always thought that it would wash out and the irrational would be, wouldn't be there and that people acting in their own rational long in term interest would essentially uh, sustain the system. And indeed, we had, uh, through 2007, we had been through an extraordinarily long period of economic stability with very little weakness. And it was, it's, very, it's a very unusual period. But uh, what happened in 2008, September the 15th, 2008, I remember the day very well, Lehman defaulted, and a fundamental thing happened. It was the greatest financial crisis in world history. To be sure, it wasn't the greatest economic crisis. That was the Great Depression. But for the first time ever, uh, all financial markets shut down. Uh, and most importantly, the overnight markets. Uh, in, uh, and that required sovereign credit coming in. And eventually, uh, uh, it created a system uh, which uh, basically uh, tried, to hold the, tried to hold the thing together, which it did. The difficulty that uh, I have with, uh, with my view was that uh, that was not supposed to happen. It's the first time it ever happened, and it probably will not happen again for 50 years. Uh, but it will happen, and it will happen because where my flaw in my reasoning was is that animal spirits, so to speak, actually have a systematic capability of acting. I mean, people, people get fearful or euphoric in a very systematic and demonstrable way. So I just, this book I was mentioning I wrote last year, I sat down and said to myself, where was I wrong? How did I miss the most important thing in economics in my lifetime? And uh, you know, what is it that caused the boats to back up outside of Singapore within days of that never happening before? In the United States, uh, the last time we actually had markets shutting down was uh, in 1907, when the call money market shut down for one day. It, at the over, that's the overnight rate back then. It never shut down during the 1930s. And indeed, uh, uh, it's an unprecedented event, uh, which I'm in the process still of putting together how to figure it out. You, now, you were not the only one who missed this one. Um, but, I um, the, but, but if I may, let, let, let's turn to a few other questions, because I know there were well, several there, hands there up. The, there, there just one quick issue on, OK. Please. We'll, we'll come back to the. the, the, the on the Piketty the, issue. The, the, we the should come back to the Piketty issue, issue. More, more, more generally. I, had a, I was going to wrap up with that. We had a question all the way on the back, please. Mr. Chairman, Natalie Liu with uh, Voice of America. In your meetings with Chinese officials, did it ever occur to you to suggest perhaps they could form a, a uh, study group on uh, Atlas Shrugged? <laughs> no, it never, it never did, but I will tell you something. I had a very close relationship with Zhu Raji, and I will tell you, uh, for someone who was born, bred, and educated 
uh, essentially during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I had never run into, ran into anybody who knew more about how capitalism worked <laughs> than, than, than uh, you. So uh, the answer to your question is no, I never did, but I had a suspicion I might never had, I probably didn't need to. Great, we have a question right here on the front. Uh, Bob Bastani from the Department of Energy. Um, my question is really directed to both of you, um, and it starts off with the observation that Diana did some exceptional work, I think, around 2005 uh, and thereabouts, talking about the extraordinarily large uh, global liquidity problem um, that, uh, that we were seeing emerge. I think it was historically large. And I've always thought that that was really one of the reasons why the financial markets got weaker and weaker and weaker. It was very hard to deal with all of this liquidity in there. I'm wondering, both of you, what's your view on the, you know, the, the, uh, that liquidity and what it did to the markets and, and the, the financial markets in specific? I'm also very curious about your view on, on uh, Japan and um, how their QE uh, experiment uh, is apt to work. Well, I'll only state the facts because I'm sure people want to hear, but I think you're, you're right in saying some of the work that we've done honed in on an interesting dynamic, which was in 1980, uh, the, the stock of financial assets was one-time GDP, global GDP. By 1990, it was twice. By 2000, it was three times global GDP. And so this level of leverage of the value of financial assets over the underlying flow of economic activity was demonstrating a characteristic that we'd never seen before. And we didn't call it either when we were looking at this, but we certainly knew this to be a different dynamic. But your thoughts on that, I think, uh, would be great. Well, uh, what the data show, as I ind indicated at the very beginning, is that we did have QEs, essentially, first developing here, and then the Bank of England, and then it spread around the world. There is evidence that it had a significant impact on asset prices, mm -hmm. uh, basically because if you force down the real long-term rate, uh, the cap rate on real estate goes down, the price earnings, the earnings price ratio goes down in the stock market, and we had an asset explosion mm -hmm. all over the world. In other words, this is, you know, people parochially think that the housing boom and stock market boom, the dot-com boom, were U.S. phenomenon. They were, but you find it everywhere else. I mean, the, in the housing boom, uh, housing prices uh, in the United States went up about on average. Uh, not only that, but uh, we had very much the same thing uh, in Canada and Australia without the secondary consequences of the toxic uh, subprime problem. So, I mean, it wasn't, it's, these things are just are, were, were everywhere. Do you want to say a word on Japan as well? Well, uh, Japan had... Uh, the same issue, of course. J Japan was growing at 4% a year for years. And I don't know if you remember Herman Kahn. Mm -hmm. Herman Kahn wrote a f famous book forecasting that in the 21st century, Japan would overtake everybody, just in time to miss it. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I was having a very interesting conversation with Kichi Miyazawa, who then was finance minister, ju just after the crash. And he, he was prime minister prior to that. Uh, and I went through my uh, let, let the markets liquidate, et cetera, rhetoric, and explaining how it was working in Japan or wouldn't. And it, it, impl uh, it implied that the loan losses would require very significant bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, we in the Resolution Trust Corporation actually went through exactly the same thing very successfully. And I went through this, and uh, uh, Miyazawa, with his perfect English, sat there and listened to me. And, he, and then he smiled and he said, uh, Alan, you're quite correct on your diagnosis of what's happening here. 
but you just do not understand Japanese culture. For a bank to call a loan which bankrupts a company induces a loss of face, and that is culturally not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the reason, fundamentally, that uh, Japan was caught up in a very cultural bind where to do the type of liquidation required after the huge boom, remember that the value of real estate in, in the palace in Tokyo was equal to the value of the real estate in California. Now, <laughs> that tells you that something was awfully skewed. We have a number of questions. I see your microphone came up. If people can't, can people still hear in the back? Great. Uh, yes, hand it all the way in the back. Excellent. Thank you. Um, back here. My name is Oliver Kim. I'm the uh, US correspondent with an Austrian newspaper called Die Presse. I have a question on another new book that came out recently. It's Mike Lewis's uh, book about high frequency trading, uh, Flash Boys. My question is, have you read it already? What do you make of Mr. Lewis's uh, statement that um, the stock markets in the US are basically rigged uh, because of the way that high frequency traders can actually manipulate market prices? And, ge and if not, generally speaking, what in your view is the, the economic and social added value that this type of trade getting asks, uh, adds to financial markets, and should they be regulated more strictly? Thank you. Well, uh, let's first start off with the issue of uh, what those types of organizations do. The first thing they do is they make money. Now, if they make money, they have to be buying low and selling high. But that is precisely what market stabilization is. And what the difference is in this fast trading is a matter of degree. There is a regulation of the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, for in recent years which requires that when an order comes into a broker, he is required to seek out amongst a whole series of potential sources for the highest bid or, or offer. That takes a matter of seconds. But the technology has so extraordinarily changed over, the, over recent years that people who want to front load the, 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 the actual transaction have the capability of doing that. Now, uh, it's the first thing. Uh, all of the data indicate that the cost of transactions in the stock market have come down very significantly in recent years. And they all relate to this particular issue. So that the question is, is the market rigged? The answer is, in an odd way, it is rigged by the SEC regulation. If they would repeal that, I think you would find that the ability of all these people to compete with one another would disappear in that the, the convergence would occur in a manner which everyone would get the lowest, the, the lowest bid or the, uh, get, would, able, would able to get the lowest transaction costs. Uh, I don't think the market is any more rigged than it ever is, but well, uh, I don't know what rigging the market is without being very specific about what they do. And in most instances, it's either a structural problem in the market itself which can be changed, or it's a regulation which is creating an unnecessary uh, impact. Questions? Let's pick here on the second row, please. I'm Glenn Fukushima with the Center for American Progress. Can I get you back to Japan? You talked about Japan of the past. What about Japan of the future? Are you um, optimistic about Abenomics? Uh, Arrow 1 and Arrow 2, monetary and fiscal, seem to be getting reasonably good reviews. Uh, Arrow 3, growth policy, not getting very good reviews. There are some also who predict that perhaps Japan will be the center of the next major global financial crisis. What's your assessment of how Abenomics will do? Well, Japan's got a very major problem in the sense the population is aging. Uh, and more importantly, if you look at the way 
over the years, uh, financial markets have worked during periods of normal interest rates. So you would find that the JGBs uh, would be, 10-year JGBs would be yielding 1% when the rest of the world at 10-year maturities would be yielding 5 and 6%. And the reason, of course, is I'm sure you're aware that the issue of Japanese um, savings, uh, which I mean, was originally the postal savings system, which had create a huge amount of money going into yen-denominated assets. And the reason that it didn't go abroad largely was because of the fact that what Miyazawa told me, it's essentially there is a patriotic issue involved here. And it's a cultural issue. And uh, they just didn't do that sort of thing. So that you'd find there's very little in the way of Japanese residents uh, buying uh, in dollar denominated or Deutsche Mark denominated anything at the time. And uh, I think that that still exists. It is not a problem now because everybody is at 1% on the 10 year, but I don't think it's going to stay that way. And I think the real problem of a, uh, uh, Japanese policy is going to emerge when uh, there is a significant uh, increase in global interest rates, which will happen eventually. But there's also another problem here in the sense that uh, Japanese, uh, for decades, had a significant current account surplus. And that surplus has come down and down and down. And at some point, it's going to turn negative. Basically, as the population ages and there's more and more consumption, and more and more the necessarily lack of, sa lack of savings because they're consuming the savings. And that means that the current account deficit would come down. But at the point they go to a current account deficit for a protracted period of time, it necessarily means you're going to have to borrow money in the global markets at global interest rates. And with the size of the stock of the yen-denominated uh, Japanese debt, uh, that can create some real instabilities. So I'm worried about what can happen there. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, the uh, Bank of Japan is a very sophisticated operation. And uh, I uh, always got along with them extremely well and learned a great deal about what they do. They are acutely familiar with all of this. Let's try to squeeze in a couple more questions. We've got one gentleman in the back, uh, third row up from the back. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, it's Harry Broadman from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Chairman Greenspan, you haven't said very much about the uh, role of emerging markets apart from China as an engine of global growth. And there is much in the literature suggesting that this is a secular phenomenon as opposed to a cyclical phenomenon. I wonder if you might opine about uh, what you see the role of emerging markets uh, being in terms of driving growth over the next 10 years or so. Well, let's go back to the issue of the end of the Cold War when uh, the Berlin Wall came down, and the economic ruin behind the Iron Curtain was far greater than anyone had anticipated. That caused a dramatic change in the third world nations who be, were largely neutral, as you remember at the time. And uh, almost all of them uh, abandoned various different forms of Fabian socialism and collective types of markets. Remember that Nehru was a pure Fabian socialist in, in an orthodox sense. I mean, he really seriously believed that you could run India uh, with a bunch of excellent technocrats, and it didn't work. But it became obvious that none of that worked. Uh, 
in the Soviet Union. And so you've got this huge change in China, uh, the, the Asian tigers, the, the, whole, the whole third world, in effect, uh, embraced capitalism. And you got this extraordinary change, especially in China, in the extent of GDP in the developing nations. And for a protracted number of years, the growth rate in the developing nations were almost twice that in the developed world. They created major increases in savings because they couldn't consume all their new income. And they eventually led to that savings glut, uh, which Ben Bernanke originally identified, and created a, a dramatic change in the structure of third world or developing nations and the developed world. Uh, that is coming to an end. Uh, the rate of growth in the developing world, especially in uh, some of the, I mean, Latin America is an obvious case where you, know, you have Venezuela and Argentina uh, holding down the whole system. And uh, uh, it's also true, I mean, India is not making the progress that uh, China has made. And I'm, I don't know whether you're going to eventually conclude that China is still a developing nation, but it's going to run into the fact of its inability to create indigenous uh, innovation. And so I think that uh, the big movement in the d increasing in the share of the GDP in the developing world is a sense of global GDP, I think that is now questionable. The only area which is still functioning are the Asian tigers, who still look formidable. But, uh, and there are certain Latin American countries that are doing very well. But uh, that sharp divergence, I think, is my judgment, is probably over. Let me, uh, we're coming to the end, and we've been uh, very, we'll be very disciplined about ending on time, but maybe I'll loop it back to the very beginning. Um, you brought up um, Piketty's new book. Uh, who would have thought that a French economist book would be the top sell, number one top seller? Um, quick question to the audience. How many of you have read the book? How many of you have re read reviews of the book? There we go. Um, <laughs> At its core, he's asking fundamental questions about capitalism, uh, which has been a topic that you uh, are a big spokesperson for. What do you think of his ultimate diagnosis about capitalism yielding an income concentration, a wealth concentration model? And what do you think about his policy proposals? Well, it isn't capitalism. It's something else. The question is, what is it that has created, you know, everyone know what the Gini coefficient is? Of, it's a measure of the degree of income and wealth people know. inequality. Uh, well, the uh, Gini coefficient has been rising fairly considerably uh, recently. But there is a fundamental problem that uh, I discussed in my book a year ago, uh, in which uh, you've got I don't know, the best way of putting it would be that there is no evidence in human history that the, the intelligence level on average has changed. That is, this, I mean, uh, you read Euclid or Newton and Einstein, they all are extraordinarily perceptive at about the same level. You get a compositional change, but there is no evidence that the average IQ of the human, human population has changed. On the other hand, uh, you've got an issue of ever-increasing technology, which is basically irreversible because ideas build on ideas, build on ideas. And uh, we're finding, even now, that the issue, the, the system is becoming 
so complex because what causes rising standards of living is a rise in the share and the ratio of assets in an economy to ours. And uh, all the basic data very clearly show that per capita GDP is very closely related to the proportion of capital that's implied over the number of hours worked. That's, that's been the case since cavemen developed tools. Uh, but the problem here is there is no evidence that degree of technology is slowing down. Uh, it does mean that fewer and fewer human beings have the capacity to work in it and to make it function. That means that their marginal product is increasing all the time. And so you have individuals who contribute to the, the wealth of the nation an ever-increasing proportion. We're getting to the point that the, techno the, the depth of the technologies is such that are fewer and fewer people can function in it. At the end of uh, World War II, the United States had a, a workforce which was basically, the median was high school graduates. They had the capacity to operate steel mills, assembly plants of the automobile manufacturers, the, the technology of the time, so that the, the, the cutting edge technology could be handled by people back then with essentially a high school education. That has gradually and increasingly changed. And we're finding that uh, we're getting the, uh, 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 an ever smaller group of people can run the system. And that's creating a very marked rise in the Gini coefficient. Strangely enough, uh, Piketty talks in terms of the rates of return. Well, essentially, he's saying the same thing that I am. The education system in the United States can't move fast enough. The one thing I think we can do, and I think that income inequality is a very dangerous political phenomenon, one thing we could do which would be very helpful instead of talking is to take H-1B immigration quotas, which delimit the amount of people who can come into the United States with high skills. Everyone in this room is being subsidized by the fact that we don't allow our competitors to come in from abroad. All of our incomes would be lower. That would do more to solving the issue, at least temporarily, won't do it permanently, but temporarily than uh, most anything else I can think of. We could continue this conversation all afternoon, I'm sure, but uh, it is 1.30, and I will let you all get back to work. But very importantly, thank you so much, Chairman Deuce, and fantastic all around the world. Thank you.